Hey mama, it's Tori here. Before the show gets going, I want to invite you to become a member of the Momsiety Club. Members not only help to support the making of the show, but you get some perks too. You'll get access to a wonderful supportive group of moms online where you can ask whatever questions or just event what you need, as well as as weekly exercise classes to give your body a little boost along with your mind so you're refreshed for the rest of the week. And if you can't make it live, you can get access to all the replays in the members area. And did I mention it's less than $10 a month? When you're ready to join, just go to join.momsietyclub.com. All right, let's get to the show. Welcome to the Momsiety Club podcast. I'm your host, Tori Levine, a former mental health worker with degrees in psychology and criminal justice. So I know the importance of keeping calm in a difficult situation. But when I had my kids, I found myself full of anxiety. One day, everything clicked and I made a commitment to own my anxiety so it doesn't own me. And that's why I started the Momsiety Club podcast. Each week, we'll discuss the ups, the downs, and anxieties of motherhood. So join me and let's get rid of this momsiety together. Welcome to episode 16 of the Momsiety Club podcast. On today's episode, you are going to hear my conversation with licensed marriage and family therapist, Amber Hawley. Before we get started, I want to thank you for listening. I love hearing from you and helping and supporting you however I can. You can reach out, send me a message on social media. I'm at Mom Zayedi Club on Instagram and Facebook. And you can also email hello at momsietyclub.com just to say hi, share a little milestone that your little one has reached, or share something that you're struggling with right now in motherhood. If this is your first time listening to the podcast, know that if I reference anything in the episode articles, um, I reference some episodes of Amber's podcasts, they are all linked down in the show notes. So if you're making dinner, getting the baby to sleep, doing any of your other amazing multitasking mom superpowers, you don't need to worry about taking notes or remembering what to look up later. You can find all the little links in the show notes. Amber Holly is a licensed marriage and family therapist. She is the host of The Couples Fix and My Biz Bestie podcasts. She is a wife and mom of three kids. We covered so many topics about getting your relationship back after baby, trying to figure out how to find time for yourself as a couple. Should you schedule date nights? Should you schedule sex? How do you connect with your partner? When you can't predict anything, you'll hear some great tips from Amber in this interview. Hello, Amber. Thank you so much for joining me and being here for the Momsiety Club podcast today. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited about today. Yes, me too. And I want to, I guess, first tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll dive into the good, deep, sure. dirty stuff. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, so I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. Um, and I have a practice in California, although now I live in North Carolina, but I still have my practice in California. And I'm also a, uh, I guess I would, I, I always resist the word, but I'm also a coach for women entrepreneurs uh, with the My Biz Bestie podcast and brand. And I have a brand called Couples Fix where I help people online. So it's coaching instead of therapy with their relationships. So I do a few things. I'm also a mom of three. um, And I've been with my husband for 23 years. So definitely have experience in those long-term relationships. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And what else? I I live on coffee. Coffee and sarcasm pretty much fuel my day. (laughs) Yes. I I really think they should fuel everyone's day. (laughs) In the world be. (laughs) Exactly. You'll have more fun. (laughs) And I guess I maybe I should say, so my specialties, you know, as a therapist are couples. And actually, uh, I did a lot of perinatal training. So this was like the perfect fit because I love helping 
you know, I love helping new moms and new parents and couples like navigate those, those beginning, you know, months and days and years after having children. And there is a lot to it. And I think you, I think there's a difference between just having a couples counselor or a marriage therapist, um, working with someone postpartum and somebody who's also really worked in that field and studied that because there's a lot of complexities to that alone. Absolutely. So, um, you have that very unique position, which is awesome. Um, so when I posed a question in the Monsiety Club membership and we were chatting about having you on the main topics that all the moms wanted to really ask questions about were getting your relationship back after having a baby. How do you divide up the household tasks and care of the baby, care of yourself, care of your house, as well as not, sorry, as well as find time for, you know, date nights uh, that don't solely focus about talking about the baby or you know, what's going on in the house that day. Right. Yeah. Well, and I, I know when we talked beforehand, you, there were some other things and I was like, oh, well, each of those could be its own episode because there's yes. so much. Right. <laughs> and, but those are the main struggles and I see it, you know, I've been working with couples for like 13 years. And so that it's such a common thing to have come up. Like how does having a baby change your relationship? And it can be, all the way from like, you know, we're just feeling disconnected and we just haven't found our groove all the way to it really just, you know, upending the relationship and causing chaos because everything, I I always say like having a baby is like putting a spotlight on any issues you may have had beforehand because Mm -hmm. now you don't have like the bandwidth to do all your coping mechanisms and, you know, all of that. So it's like all that stuff comes up. So yeah, I, I think it's an important thing. Um, so I guess I'll start with the like reconnecting and like redefining your relationship after having a baby. That sounds great. Okay. Although you gave me a whole nother idea of something to ask. But... <laughs> well, keep... feel free, feel free. Okay. <laughs> this is, yeah, like I said, this is a big one. But yeah, the uh, it depends on the stage. So like, you know, obviously those first few weeks, especially if it's your first child, you know, everything is so new. It's both exhilarating and exhausting. Um, and then I find like, and we know like babies often sleep a lot during that time, even though, you know, you're, you're just getting used to everything. And so every, you know, it's total chaos, but then there's that period where they start to not sleep and, <laughs> Mm-hmm. And all the things start happening and, and the exhaustion sets in. And so then, and also like, you know, people can kind of tolerate like not connecting with each other for so long. And then right. it gets to a point and, you know, everybody's different for some people that could be like three weeks for some people that could be six months. Like, and then they're like, okay, wait a minute, this is no longer working. Yeah. So I think a lot of problems are because of that disconnection. Um, not having that dedicated time and space to give to the relationship and each other, which is really hard because you're also not able to do that for yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're trying to find time. How do you find time for the baby, find time to sleep, find time to, you know, take care of life. And if this isn't your first baby, the other children, you know, right. And then find time for each other. It's really, really hard. And so I think it's about remembering that whatever you figure out, this, this cuts both ways. One, it, it's not forever. It's a temporary solution. So that there's hope in that, but that's also can be really depressing, especially if you're like a type A person, you Mm -hmm. know, like I'm a little type A, I like to like, I want to know exactly what this is going to look like. And you know, now this is it. And I get to, I get to count on this and it's like, and that's, yeah. And that's definitely like the mom's anxiety part where I always say like your control, you need to know what is going to happen and plan it. If you give me a plan, I can reduce my anxiety, but you can't do that with a newborn, with a baby and kind of what you were saying earlier. Yeah. I think for me personally, it was more difficult 
as they were a little older. I'd say like maybe three to six months for my yeah, first. I agree. And for my second, I think it was just that lack of connection to my husband. We had not been out by ourselves until like a week before he turned one. Mm -hmm. And then a month after he turned one, COVID happened. So, oh gosh. Oh, <laughs> so no. now what's the idea? But I'm uh, sorry, I <laughs> took us off elsewhere, but um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's true. I mean, and that's the thing, right? Like not being able to count on it. And, you know, again, if you're a planner, you're a little type A, you know, or anybody with anxiety, like you're saying, it is, it does feel settling to like have something to count on. And there is nothing that you can count on less than when you're dealing with children. So <laughs> they will always bamboozle you. It's like they feel your energy, you know? Oh, definitely. So, <clears throat> I think that becomes the hard part. So that's why I say it cuts both ways. Cause sometimes that can, I say to people like, okay, like this, this, let's do this but know that this isn't forever. So this doesn't mean this is how your relationship's going to look forever. And at the same time, like you put a lot of effort into making that happen and it's not going to stay that way. Like you're going to have to shift it up again, like eventually. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, but I do think that that can be helpful to kind of keep perspective of, okay, maybe, you know, cause I, I will hear couples that say like, well, you know, I need more than this. We need more connection or more time or more whatever. And it's like, yeah, okay, fine. But in this stage, that's not really realistic, right? You know, it's the same thing with like taking care of the house. In that first year, you know, and if you're nursing, especially, and even if you're not though, like I've, you know, obviously I've seen the whole gamut. That first year though is so intense in taking care of the baby and the bonding and dealing with you know, the sleep disruptions and the teething and all the things that come up that first year is so hard. And especially with the first child that you kind of got to let things go. And that is one of the things that I have most people like fight back on so much. And mm -hmm. I was like, Hey, get, I get it. Like I am a little OCD ish. I love my house perfectly clean. I have things labeled, like drawers are labeled. Like I love it. I like color code it. And that in the first year, it's like, forget it. That's not, that can't be your priority, right? right. It'll just make yourself nuts. <laughs> right, right. You have to be able to um, let go of, you know, maybe have one space that is perfectly clean where, and if that is, for my case, is not where my husband goes. And <laughs> <laughs> like, be okay with that. Uh, and then know that, it can come. <laughs> exactly. You know, what's funny is, so my children are now 10, eight and six. And I still, I mean, it's a little different now. Cause now I, you know, I have somebody coming weekly to like clean my house and they're a little bit older, but even I would say like two years ago, I, I still like what kept my calm was my bedroom was clean. Cause I, I literally had nothing in my bedroom except, you know, our clothes. And so as long as you had the clothes, like either in the hamper or the closet, my bedroom was clean, my car, I would clean once a week and my purse. And that was like the thing that kept me going. Cause I was like, I need to have my little spaces be organized. Now, trust me, they often look like, you know, like a poop show, <laughs> keeping it clean. I was like, I usually, <laughs> like they, it usually looks terrible, but I would take that time once a week. And it was kind of like that ritual. And I think that right. can be like a good strategy if you're you know, trying to say, okay, I need to have something under my control, something that no one else mm -hmm. messes up that I can kind of take care of. So, and it, it does feel good, right? Yes. I, I love that idea of the ritual because that has its own calming aspect as well. Absolutely. Um, but what you reminded me of a little bit earlier, as well as what we were just discussing is now there is a lot I'm seeing on social media and being addressed of like this rage and anxiety, this mom postpartum anger. And these are actually from mom psychologists as well saying, you know, this overstimulation can trigger, can just be a trigger and oh, absolutely. that will set you down that negative spiral. And I, and I know, you know, the laundry everywhere is my <laughs> trigger. So the ritual 
get tying it back is I love how you're saying just the ritual of one little place. You can do it for yourself once a week. You know, you set aside that time and make sure that you protect that time. Um, and I also feel like that's a realistic self-care because that's what I'm huge on promoting. We can't all go to the spa. We can't all, you know, go to the beach for a day or, you know, a month, like we would love to, (laughs) but what is realistic is, you know, being alone for two minutes or organizing your car, those types of things. So I guess, where do we find that and bring that into realistic self-care for our relationships? Yeah. So it's, it, I think it's along the same lines, right? Because that I do, and when I work with couples, I really emphasize making it realistic for your life. And again, having to make the adjustment that it might not be what you really are feeling you need in the moment, but it's better than nothing. And I think we can get caught into that all or nothing. Um, I did just want to honor that whole, like you're saying the rage parts. Like I still have those moments. Like sometimes when I clean the house and I, if, if anybody's in the house, which they are now always, right. Cause of COVID, <laughs> I get rageful because I see the stuff they've ruined or wrecked or broken, or like I had just cleaned and like organized the linen closet. And then they decided that they were going to play some kind of game with all the towels and the toilet paper. And mm-hmm. I almost lost, I mean, I, I lost my mind. Like it was, I couldn't even speak. I was so angry. And it's like, obviously it can be fixed. It's a little thing, but it's one of those things of like, no, I put my hard earned energy and effort into this and you're destroying it. It's really common. And so, you know, I think in that regards, I just want to say like, one, I think if you can come back and own and apologize, if you do really lose your mind, Um, but two, also talking to your family when you're not in that space, like your, your partner, your husband, whatever, talking to them about like, how it's causing you stress and anxiety. I think that's a huge piece because they don't often get it. Like they think like, wow, you just lost your mind for no reason. You know, like something's right. wrong. And then you're like, no, there was a valid reason. <laughs> like this is why right. when you're upset in that moment, it's not going to be a productive conversation. So, but going back to the question of how do you do that for your relationship? So that again, so going back to like, depending what, what, uh, where you're at in your, your, um, you know, having children, whether what stage you're in. Mm -hmm. So again, I I feel like those early weeks, it tends to be like, everyone's so focused on the baby and it, it often feels okay for people. Now, again, everybody's different. There might be, you know, partners that feel very like abandoned or left out, or they felt that way, especially if you had a really hard pregnancy Mm -hmm. So they've been feeling the loss for a long time. So everybody is different, but usually that first, you know, few weeks is you're figuring it all out. But as it goes on, it's like, okay, how can we make this work? And especially, you know, a lot of people I talk to, they don't have family nearby or they don't have somebody that they know or feel like they can trust with their child. And that makes it exponentially harder you know, for those who do have people that they trust and that they um, feel comfortable give, you know, having them watch their children so they can have that space and make that time, I think use it. It's so great. Right. The people, and it's not to say that even if you have that, it's still a struggle because mm-hmm. people feel guilty. Like I, you know, I'll hear like, oh, my mother-in-law watches our child two days a week. And so I feel guilty asking her to do it on the weekend, you know, something like that. Right. It could be, or and that then also there's so many dynamics there with getting into family, extended family relationships and parenting, which absolutely that's a whole nother, it's a whole nother thing. And so, and then I guess, you know, being in Silicon Valley, there's a lot of people who are transplants. And so they don't have extended family. They might have friends, but they also are like, Hey, my friends have young kids. I don't want to put them out. You know, there's all kinds of reasons, right? But I know for us, like I had moved to California from Minnesota, so I had no family there. My husband's family all ended up moving to Oregon and he moved back to the Bay Area. And so he, we didn't really have anybody that we could kind of rely on. And um, I had always worked in a different city than where we lived until we had children. So I had no support network in the city that we lived because I had always commuted to either San Jose or San Francisco. 
And so once I had the baby, it was like, oh my gosh, like I know nobody here. And so, you know, that was a whole, that's a whole, like, again, that's a whole separate podcast right. episode, but, <laughs> but, but I understand it because we went a long time without getting that, that time alone. And then it was, um, you know, like, gosh, it was years before we even had a 24 hour overnight away. And mm-hmm. even to this day, we still don't get that time. And then, and then like, like you're saying, anybody who's recently had a child during COVID, even if I, I have clients who have tons of extended family and always had that support and now they're not comfortable right. letting, you know, visiting them. So it's, mm-hmm. it's a hard, hard time. I mean, there's an extra layer for sure, but I'll kind of talk to in general, because I think, you know, as things progress and hopefully, you know, vaccines come out and all that, whatever, that people are able to go back out and live life again. I think it's about figuring out unconventional ways to have that time together. And so one of the things I do think it's really important to have intentional date nights, but for us, like I was saying, we had three kids in four and a half years. So one to pay somebody to watch our kids with that many young kids is very expensive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like that we just couldn't afford it. And then two, I mean, we could here and there, we had to, like we would have, but we didn't have the person. We didn't have the people that we needed. Right. So it was like, okay, well we need something more regular though. We can't just have once a month. That's not enough for connection. We need something regular. And so I really advocate like date nights in, and there's ways to kind of structure that so that you, you make the space, you teach your kids to kind of respect those boundaries. Mm-hmm. Now, when they're younger, it takes more time and it may not look perfect, but you're setting the foundation for that. And so that's one of the strategies. The other one is, you know, once they were, we would do like daycare, like twice a week. And, um, and so we would go like on a lunch date. Like for us, it became mm-hmm. that, you know, because it wasn't until last year that all of our kids were in school. So we were figuring out like, what are ways that we can have that time together? And, and it's not, you know, we weren't going out on Saturday night. Like it just, that wasn't going to be realistic. Right. Right. So I think it is about looking at that. Like, is it a breakfast date? Is it a, is it a, like, you know, there's that period of time of like, okay, at not from nine to 10, you have intentional connection. And I think that's the key. It's like, you have that time together and you know that it's set aside for each other, not for other things. And of course, you know, if things come up, you have that conversation, you don't just assume, but you have those conversations, but you figure out ways to, to, to make that time available. So I'll go back to like the date night in. So that was something that we, uh, my husband and I did a lot. So he was working, he works at UPS. So I call it being a UPS widow because they work like 12 to 14 hour days every day. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I mean, there's no like, oh, hey, I got a thing to go to tonight. No, you work until the work is done. Right. And there are a lot of people that, you know, have very demanding jobs. And so their time together is not a lot. And then I would work two days a week. And then I worked all day Saturday because then I could see all my clients, but I didn't have to pay for childcare, you know, so he would Mm -hmm. be there. So Sunday was our only day as a family together. So our time together was very limited. So one thing that we did is like Saturdays, I would go, I would work from like 8am until like five ish, sometimes six. And like, I, so I'd be gone all day. So we started doing date night in where every Saturday, and you don't have to be as rigid. I don't want to say rigid, but you don't have to, you can change it up. But for some reason, it just made us so happy, right? Right. Every Saturday, I when I was about to leave, I would call and place an order at our favorite steak place. <laughs> and I would, we, I would order our meals. You know, we'd have this really great meal. I would run and pick it up on my way home. And only because this particular place did not deliver. Otherwise I would have door dashed it because <laughs> it is worth the fees to reduce any load on you. Like it that's is. my feeling. And you, and you, you know, and it's like, oh yeah, we don't have a lot of money. I was like, well, one, we're not paying for a babysitter, but two, this is also, it's a temporary period in your life where you feel like it's so hard to be mobile. So it's mm-hmm. like, I'm willing to spend a little money during this time, but yes, this place didn't. So I would run and pick it up. And as soon as I got home, like it was known, like, this is our date time. 
So it wasn't like, oh, hey, I'm just finishing up working in the backyard or, oh, I've got something to take care of. It's like, no, we both knew like once I was home, that was our time together. And so we would give the kids their food. We would set them up in the other room with like a show or a movie. And we had um, converted our garage into a playroom. And so for whatever reason, we really loved that room. So we would be in there and we would eat our dinner and like watch a movie and just be together. And so that was our date night in, but it really felt amazing. And so, you know, our kids occasionally, of course, would come in and be like, hey, you know, you know, interrupt us or whatever. But we kept teaching them. We would answer them quickly. And we we're like, okay, no, you go play with your thing, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and by then, I would say my youngest, she was even one. But, you know, they when they're with the older siblings or they start to learn. And it's not like we knew where they were. The whole house is baby proof. They're going to be fine. They, right. were, they were literally 25 feet from us. <laughs> yeah. The, and so that, <laughs> we've started having time just after dinner and the boys will go into the living room and yeah, it luckily Eli has now hit that age. I, I remember there was a whole lot of anxiety because Ruben was four and a half when Eli was born. So he was independent. He was like yes. always playing on his own, this and that. And then I was like, oh gosh, I don't know how to do this. There's absolutely no time for us now. And luckily now I wouldn't say like 15, 18 months range is like, he's much better to go and sit and play in the other room so we can at least finish our conversation. Yes. Um, now the, now the six-year-old's in and he's listening in and from the other room. What's that? What's that? <laughs> so that, that <laughs> its own, poses his own issues, but, <laughs> but that's the thing. It is in the training them. And again, like I've, I've heard every piece of pushback that's come from, you know, from any couple about, oh, I don't feel comfortable. And it's like, okay, realistically, they're not going to die. Like the whole goal is to keep them alive. But what you're doing is you're also setting the foundation for them that this is mommy and daddy time and don't interrupt, you know, and they're going to interrupt like that, you know, the kids are going to come in and be like, what? And then we'll say, this is our conversation. Mm -hmm. Is there something you need? You need to go. We're having our time together. And it's, you know, it's like, oh, I couldn't do that to my kids. It it feels how responsive we are all day long. Sometimes (laughs) it does feel that I'm like, mommy and daddy are talking. (laughs) I'm like, I feel bad, but I'm like, no, like mommy and daddy are talking. We need time to talk just a month on like between ourselves too. <laughs> exactly. And if you did that all the time and never were attentive to your child's needs and never cared what they said, that's a whole different thing, but that's not what we're talking about. We're right, talking right. about teaching them. There are times when they should interrupt and there are times when they shouldn't, you know, unless somebody's bleeding, of course, like that's right. the, you teach them that you're, it's a good life skill. First of all, right. <laughs> Cause trust it's, me, I see adults respectful. who clearly never learned that. <laughs> They don't know when not to jump into a conversation, but it's Uh, also one of those things of you're not, you're not going to crush your child's soul. They need a little more resilience than that. And you are being attentive to them. And that's the whole thing. It's like, we're always like, Oh, what's going on? You know, what, what are you thinking? What can I help you with? You know, that's, you know, you're a good parent. So it's like, that's not what we're, we're talking about teaching them some boundaries really. And, you know, they're going to recover like, you know, kids recover way faster than we do as adults. So, oh, yeah. and it's not even mean, but I've heard it all. I've heard it all. And so, you know, and I think when Ella was little, when she was under one, she might have even been in the room. So then we definitely had to alter like the choice of movies we were watching. Mm-hmm. We had to be more thoughtful, you know, about what was being played, but that was part of our fun. Cause we love the movies. We love doing that. And we would talk about it. And, you know, talk about it after. And then sometimes um, we would play games or we would just talk about things and have conversations. But during the movie or during our meal, we just enjoyed, you know, like, oh, we're actually in front of a TV. We're at a table in front of a TV. And we had this whole setup and it was great. And it was just fun for us. And everybody has to find their own thing, right? right? And if that's if that's the only time and you're never having conversations, that's a whole separate deal. But for us, that was the thing where it's like, for me, I didn't want to have my meal with my kids because I honestly needed one hot meal during the week. And that was my Saturday night. Like I, I was like, no, here's your food. And I would rush. And then I would sit down and I'm like, 
no one, you know, like no one asked me questions right now. <laughs> I need to eat this meal while it's warm because that is like my trigger where I get so angry because I'm like, I need one hot meal. You know? <laughs> And I'm sure everyone can relate because especially after, you know, this is with, we started doing this after I had my third child. So it's like, that was five years of not having a hot meal or holding a baby while I ate and, Mm -hmm. you know, and then having to do something, come back and everything's cold. And I'm, I'm just picky that way. I'm really into like proper temperature of food. Oh, oh, (laughs) me too. Me too. (laughs) So, yeah, I mean, I I think, and again, this is just one example, but figuring out like, how can you, like you said, create that ritual of having that time together and like long-term, if that's all we did to connect, would that be enough? No. But in this season of what we were dealing with, that was great for us because we had such limited time. It was like, got a hot meal, got got to watch something entertaining, Um, and I got to connect and we would talk and, you know, we would have a good time with that. And so it was like, that was great. And then Sunday got to be like family day. Um, my, my brain is just going on all the different topics that we can go to from this because I'll just share in my experience. And I know this was brought up from other moms is I think finding that connection first is what is necessary because your whole relationship changes there can be different dynamics. And then we get down into the whole sexual uh, aspect of your relationship. And just from what I've heard from other moms and as well as my own experience, it's like you're overstimulated, overtouched, and then you finally get one minute to yourself and your spouse is like, okay, honey. Like, (laughs) and you're, you then, and with an anxious person internalizing, then the anxiety would always be like, nope, nope, nope. I am too tightly wound to relax enough to spend time with you. <laughs> and yeah. um, I think what really was the big difference between first child and second child, as well as this whole journey in owning anxiety for myself is that now I know I'm much better. And you um, kind of touched on this earlier about saying what you need and saying like, I need this connection time or no, I can't have this right now. Just give me one second. uh, Because that, that definitely made a huge difference. And my brain just went, you said something earlier. What did you say? Um, <laughs> I was like, that is classic mommy brain. And, and for extra bonuses, COVID brain. Like, <laughs> so yeah. now everyone else gets to experience what us moms have been saying forever. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, you were talking about, um, you know, organizing something and then having it destroyed. Oh, and yes. Seconds and then <laughs> triggering you. So, yeah. And, you can very much say, I, I used to think I was just angry because I was a, you know what, yeah, you're right. <laughs> and, um, then I realized, you know, well, no, there are valid reasons. I need to be able to express these stuffing them down within myself and not talking about them is going to cause them to boil up even more and worse. Yes. So, you know, those are the things I learned. Um, between the first and the second, between like, the yeah, first the different. and the second. Yeah, and absolutely that, that helped our relationship in the end. Um, that really did help our relationship because I was always saying, well, we need to schedule like date nights. And he was kind of like, no, no, it'll just happen, whatever. And I was like, no, we need to schedule it so that we know, um, if you, if I come down from getting the kids to bed and you're sitting there on your phone, that's not connection. Like that's not connection. for me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so actually one of the things that really helped us is we scheduled going and seeing a marriage counselor just so that we would have that time. That gave us the time because otherwise we did not have that time. I will tell you a lot, a lot of the couples I see, I seeing me as a therapist is the first time and the only time they have alone together. And so, which I think is great because it's like, talk about really investing and prioritizing your relationship 
and it helps you build that muscle. And so, cause it's one hour, like you're building that muscle. And so then I would have couples who would start saying like, okay, then after session, we go to dinner, you know, like, so they started that, like, that elongating that. What we did, that was the only time we had our date nights. <laughs> exactly. And it's good because it does teach you like why the consistency needs to be there. And yes, I've heard it from everybody that, oh, it doesn't feel natural if we have to schedule it. And, um, it'll just happen. And it's like, no, it won't one. It's either going to fall on the person who's the person who organizes everything like the social organizer. And it also can set yourself, set yourself up for resentment because it's like, oh, Hey, remember it's date night. And so why do you have to remember? You don't have to remind that person. You're not that person's secretary or their parents, you know, like they need to be just as accountable. And what ends up happening is that, that, that dynamic of, okay, I run everything and take care of everything. And now I got to even take care of this. So I don't feel wanted. I don't feel like you're invested. Even if you know, logically, you're like, I know my partner loves me. Um, and again, this goes both ways, depending on who's the person that's the organizer in the family, even though often it does fall to the mom, mm-hmm. I will say it seems to be the natural roles, even though there's different, I've seen differences, but it's like, I want to feel pursued. I want to feel like you're so excited to have some time with me that you remember and show up. And so that's why I say, yeah, that's nice to have it organically happen, but that's not going to happen now that you've had kids. It's just, there's no way because there's always something to do. There's always some demand on your energy or attention. And so you need to be really, you know, thoughtful and intentional about it. And I, I think the word intentional, I just use a lot because it's like, that's the key to it. So that's why we had the agreement of, okay, six o'clock on this day is when our date night starts, whether we're going out or we're staying in. And, and my husband and I actually even did this before we had children for a while because we're both super independent. So you know, I know like some couples, when they have the kind of work schedule, we had the six days a week, really long days, not seeing each other, they would really struggle. And and that's not a negative. It's like, they needed more than that. And that's okay, because everybody's different. We're super independent. So we still had to be intentional, because that would feel horrible still. But but it was enough for us to have that connection to, to get us through the next week. And it wasn't like that was the only time we talked or connected. Right. So right. I, I am, I don't want to make it sound like that, but that's where it was like, you got to realize everybody has a different level of need. And that is not a negative thing or a positive thing. Like, Oh, we need to see each other every single day. That makes us a better couple. No, it doesn't just like we can see each other once a week and we're fine. That doesn't make you a better couple. It's just need. It's just differences. And so, but I do think you have to plan it because if you don't, it's, it creates resentment. And so that, like I was saying, I, we did that before we even had children of, cause there were those times of like, I would be so busy and he would get into things and, and we both have ADHD. And so my husband would get like down doing something and lose track of time. Mm-hmm. And then I would feel irritated. Like, Hey, <laughs> you know, what's going on here? So we had a thing where every other, every other date night, um, that we did like one, he would plan one, I would plan, but we would show up. And I think at the time it was five o'clock, five o'clock on Saturday. I, here I am, I'm ready to go. What's going on? You know, like, so no one has to be in charge of the other. And then you don't have that resentment building up. And then it feels like, Hey, we're both invested in this. Cause mm-hmm. that feels terrible, right? Like if you're like, Oh, I take care of everything. And then you're like begrudgingly showing up or I'm having to like say, Hey, put your phone down. Right. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yes, those phones. <laughs> yes, it is a common um, one. <laughs> there's a lot for listeners to, you know, be able to put in place uh, from this is that finding that realistic time together and finding the unconventional ways. I love you, how you said the unconventional ways to have time together and really prioritize to schedule that and start starting small with my first, we knew we could have a date night. Um, I remember like our first date night after Ruben, you know, Isaac made dinner. I got to have like my first alcohol after. (laughs) And that was because I knew he slept from like eight to 11 or 12. Right. Eli, nothing, (laughs) never two days in a row 
it would be like, put him down for bed 20 minutes later, put him down for bed, maybe an hour later. So there was never anything to rely on. So find those, start small. If it's 10 minutes, you know, go with a 10 minute time to connect and talk. And um, I just want to say, what about uh, the love languages? You know, know your own and know your partner's. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of love languages um, and and making sure, and the key, you know, again, I've even done whole podcasts about that because there's a lot, there's a lot of nuance to that, but the key is showing up for your partner in their love language. So if their love language is physical touch and yours isn't, we tend to express our love language in the one that we, we like, right? So being intentional about making sure that you're doing that. And I think building the habit of that. So, cause if it's not your natural way to be, but it's what they prioritize, that's the way they feel loved, then you need to do it in their language. So the reason I like, you know, realistically, there are some love languages you can't do every day, like, like easily, like uh, quality time. But if you start to build that muscle and if you do, if you try to do it every day, it becomes a habit because the problem becomes if you're like, I'll just do it when I think of it but it's not, you don't think of it. And then all of a sudden two weeks has gone by, you know, your partner's really feeling that, but you're not, maybe you were like, oh, wow, time just flew because life is busy. Right. And so figuring that out, like, again, this, if you're just had a baby, your baby's under a year, this is a harder thing. I still think though, there's ways to build in that intentionality. So you did touch on something. I, I think date night's really important. Uh, because it's intentional time together. It's an intentional time where you're connecting. And yes, I have a rule that you do not talk about the children. Um, It should not be a time for only talking about logistics because I see so many people do that. And to me, that's the same conversation you can have with a roommate. So it's not about intimacy, right? But talking about other things that you're interested in and things that you love or things that you share together, you know, whether that's fantasy travel planning or whatever it is, you know, whatever your thing is that you're into. But throughout the week, I think you should do, I call them touch points. And you should try to have a touch point every day if possible. Like I know with our old schedule, there were days where that just wasn't possible. And so, um, but trying to do it kind of regularly, because again, you, it's like you're adding money into a bank account. And so you need to give those little moments where you feel connected. And yes, those will be, tend to be shorter, right? Mm -hmm. They tend to, it could be a really great 20 minute conversation where you don't feel rushed though, where you don't feel like, Oh my, I could feel my partner just wanting to be done to go on to do their next thing. And so that doesn't feel good, but having that intentional touch point time and the, the key to that, and this was something else I know, like a lot, there was a lot mentioned, you know, going back to the thing where you were talking about regularly, you know, connecting or when your partner's like, Oh, Hey, we have a free minute, you know, like let's get together. It's, you know, nobody wants people resist the idea of scheduling sex too. And I Mm -hmm. think the problem with that is again, if it's a need that's, you know, somebody's wanting to happen in this particular season of your life, it's not going to happen if it's not scheduled or at least that there's an intention there, right? Like that, that this is a time where you're more open to it. Um, but if you're not getting any alone time, especially as a mom, then you're not having any time where nobody's like trying to touch your body or take from you or do something, then you're probably not going to be as into it. Now, everybody's different, but I I do think that that's an important thing of like, Hey, I need some space to myself. And so figuring out that as well. And I will say when we had the one child or, or Hannah, our first, it was much easier to, to do that. We would swap because we were, we were playing a man-to-man defense. Right, like, right. Quickly, as we grow, we're getting into the zone, right? Like it's a zone defense. There's always demand. But so like on the date nights that we did on date night in on Saturdays, you know, he would put the kids to bed because then I would get, you know, like 45 minutes to myself. And on those nights, I, I can't fully remember now because you know how your brain goes, but like, it wasn't about intimacy for us. That was about connection. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure it happened here and there, but that wasn't the intention. But it is really hard when you can't count on a baby being regular with their sleep. And I think that's one of those things that makes it really, really tough. And, you know, just to normalize it, you know, there's been a lot of research done about this. And the time that um, 
people report being the most unhappy in their relationship is after having children. And that improves when they go to college. And that sounds like a joke. (laughs) It kind of is, but it's not, it's actual data. And that's because it's so hard to prioritize that. Does it mean it has to be miserable? Absolutely not. I've seen couples really be intentional and have great relationships. They came in like almost ready to break up. And, but it is about saying like, it's a hard time for everybody. It's not just you, but you really have to put the effort in to make sure that it doesn't end up that way. You don't want to be miserable for 18 years. Right. You know, plus and whatever. <laughs> yeah. Plus whatever for, <laughs> for each kid, you know, each new kid. Yeah. The, uh, the touch points and talking about that because you mentioned feeling like roommates. And I remember that is exactly one of the things that I said to my husband before I said, I feel like we're roommates because we don't have this time. Everything that we get a chance to do is logistical. Like right. we need and to. And it's for the kids. For like, the house. Right. Right. So I think that that is very relatable. Um, that if you're feeling like that, that doesn't mean that you know, your marriage is over. Exactly. Right. It it is a, just something you need to work on and we'll get through, like you said before, it's a season. So. Yeah. And it is hard. I mean, don't get me wrong to say like, okay, find time for yourself and then find time as a couple. It's, it's, it's a hard thing to do, but, but it can be done. It's just about being creative. And sometimes we have these barriers that we put off, like, well, no, I can't do that. I couldn't possibly tell my child to leave the room that I'm having an adult conversation. That would just devastate them. Okay, well, if you change nothing, nothing will change. But you have to kind of open yourself up to what are other options, right? Uh, I like that I've seen this. I have yet to do it, but they were like the little date night ideas that you write on a yes. popsicle stick. And these, I think during COVID times right now, there are so many inventive ones that you can just find on Pinterest. Um, yes. and uh, although Pinterest, that's like yeah, a, whole that's a whole separate thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> they ruined my daughter's birthday, <laughs> <laughs> but for me, that final decision. So where you said you and your husband traded off on who was planning your date night or mm-hmm. that that is great because for me, I have said many times, like, I don't want to make one more decision. So yes. just pick up the stick and there you go. And then that can automatically, you know, just release any tension that's going on about having to decide one more thing. And, you know, yeah, well, because decision fatigue is real. Right. Mm -hmm. And also like going back to like the intimacy part, like, again, this is temporary, but I remember like I had a rule, like breasts are for nursing right now. I don't want anyone else touching them. So I need, not touch me there, which normally would be great, but not right now. And so, you know, I remember that, that stage of our relationship, but those are the kinds of things to think of. Like, how can you set the boundaries? Because if it feels like, oh, you just grabbed my boobs and now I want to punch you, like, that's not going to really make you very into intimacy. Right. But if you set some boundaries and kind of play with things and have them be different, then you can get into it. But you're right. Like the paradoxical thing about sex is you have to be relaxed enough to be aroused. Right. So, you know, you got to figure those things out. And so it's about figuring out how do you take care of yourself, talking to your partner about that. Like, yeah, if I feel like if I have to make one more decision, I'm going to lose my mind or, you know, this particular thing is really bothering me. I need it taken care of. Like, or or here's, to communicate those things. Here's my, my example. And this was also going to the counselor, I think gave me relaxed me enough to be able to discuss these things. So I was never yes. able to really like discuss them uh, on my own. I just felt, I don't know, uncomfortable or I was going to hurt his feelings or something like right. that. And I, you know, I looked into some of the love languages and stuff and his is touch definitely. And I'm just like, you do not touch me right now. Yes. <laughs> if you want me to touch you, then you have to give me a hug throughout the week and not just like after I'm done nursing our child, because that's definitely not going to happen. <laughs> yes. Well, and you know, it's again, I talk about love languages with couples all the time. This one just came up uh, recently with a couple 
and we were talking about like, how are you practicing, you know, your love languages? And, you know, he was saying, yes, hers was, his is physical touch. Hers was words of affirmation. And he was like, but I don't think I'm doing it right. She doesn't seem to be as happy. And then she was like, yes, he's not doing it right. <laughs> so we talked about it, but that's the thing. One, having that mediator who can, you know, be the safe space and also like negotiate, but sometimes hear things because, you know, when we're activated and upset, we don't hear it, how it's maybe intended. So having a neutral person to kind of like, oh, wait, this is what I hear. This was the intention, I think, behind this it just wasn't said well. But it was funny because even he he was talking about like saying you look beautiful or whatever. And then I said, because I do use a lot of humor in my um, counseling. And I, I was like, but you're not just saying that right before bed, right? <laughs> like, uh, you know, basically at the time that you'd like to have sex, like you're saying that in the daytime and throughout the day. <laughs> and he was like, uh, no, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that feels self-serving. That doesn't feel genuine. Right. Even if it was genuine, it doesn't feel that way. So it's like, yes, we connect with our brains first and mm -hmm. it's, uh, men do too, frankly, that's kind of a misconception, but that they don't but women especially. So if we don't feel connected to you like emotionally or, you know, if we don't feel that, that love and authenticity, you know, in our brain, then we're like less, much less likely to want to be intimate. Like, you know, to have that, like, I don't want to touch you because like, what if, you know, it's like, I'm sitting over here, like none of my needs got met this week, you know? <laughs> and so that's why you do have to talk about it though. Yeah. Because that's the thing. It's like, it's, it's a lot of it is communication, um, but it's really hard because this is not, these are not things we're taught. And like I said, a lot of couples had those communications problems before having children, but now with children, there's no bandwidth because there's no time. Mm -hmm. And so like, you might've had hours of time where you could take care of your things and take care of yourself and then connect with each other. And you felt great because you were taking care of yourself. But at the same time, that that's just not available to you right now in this season. So, you know, it is about figuring it out, getting creative, changing it up, letting go of some of your, but I can't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, as long as it's not something you can keep the ones that are really like your thing, but being a little more flexible as I guess what I'm saying, because I'm not trying to say like, let go of, Oh, I don't feel like having sex tonight. And then like, Oh, but I feel bad. So I'm going to do it obligatory sex never feels good to either partner. Your partner feels it. You feel it creates resentment. It's mm -hmm. not good. But if you're like, Hey, feeling a little stressed, I'm not really in the mood, but I could be, I could, could be, be convinced. convinced to be in the mood. <laughs> yeah. Like I could be, I could be persuaded. Things could be done to make me feel happy to be in the mood. That's different. Right. So it's mm -hmm. about figuring out those things where there's flexibility and where you're willing to, but, but I do think the boundary of no, not tonight. No, don't touch me. <laughs> Can we have sex without you touching me? That would be great. You know, like however that works, you know, you figure out how that works for you. And the same goes for a date night. It's like, you know, or that connection time. How can we figure out that? It doesn't have to be, you know, quote unquote date. Right. You know? So figuring it out, being creative. I want to ask you if you can just explain marriage counseling, couples counseling. I think a lot of people think that that is the last resort before there is a breakup or a divorce or something. Can you yeah. talk about that that's not what it is? It's not super scary. The counselor is not there to put a like wedge between the partners. You're there to bring them together. Yeah. So again, I'll go back one, the statistic is most couples will wait until there's a serious problem for six years before they seek help. Uh, that's a wow. problem because one, by then there's usually so much resentment built up that, you know, sometimes it's too little too late, right? Mm -hmm. It just happens. You know, the goal is to help the relationship and it is somebody who's trained in seeing like communication styles and kind of noticing the patterns and what's happening and why we're resistant to doing things or what's the dynamic that's happening. And they help you kind of problem solve that. And, you know, like I give suggestions, but it's like up to you guys, you're living your life. But I think it can be really beneficial for improving those things. Like we said that you don't get taught in school or in life often, like how do you 
talk about things that are really um, upsetting and triggering. How do you manage conflict? How do you communicate? How do you talk about money? How do you talk about sex? How do you talk about when you have different parenting styles? Like these are, you know, just really important things, but it is also about teaching us to create that space to have those hard conversations. Um, It does really help people build that intimacy and trust with each other because it's like, you know, your partner sees you at your worst and they also see you at your best and understanding that you are not a bad person. You're a human and none of us are perfect and we all have things to work on and we all contribute, you know? And so it's, it's anxiety provoking, but I swear when you find the right counselor or therapist, it, it can be really transformational. You know, I mean, I love the work and I love seeing couples go from that place of like contemplating divorce, thinking they're not compatible to being like so connected and happy and really thriving in their relationship. It's fantastic, but it is, it is, it's a hard thing. So I get, I get why people are resistant, you know, and Mm -hmm. I will say we went, um, we went and saw a couples counselor after having our first child, because I believe in it. Like I believe in the process. Everyone needs that outside person, I think at times. And so it was really helpful for us because I could tell him this is what's happening but he can't hear that from me because I'm his wife. I'm not, right. you know, I'm not therapist Amber, I'm his wife. Um, and so, yeah, it can be really helpful, <laughs> you know, and that's another thing I hear a lot. Like, like I'll say something and the partner will be like, oh yeah. And then like the wife or the husband will say, I've been saying that for five yeah. years. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I know, but I'm not married to that person. So they can hear me. They can't hear you. It's just, that's just life. <laughs> that is life. You're explaining everything right now that my husband does workout wise that I've been telling him for a decade. Saturday <laughs> is our, our 10 year anniversary. Amazingly. So yeah. And then he like magically sees something on the internet or some other physical trainer person will tell him something. And I was like, I was like, um, can, can I have like a rewind button right now? <laughs> and, exactly. And it's so true. I mean, I have had, I have clients who like one of the one of the people is a doctor and the, and there are times where the other person will accept influence or take their information. But often it's like, Oh yeah, I was watching this YouTube channel and it's like <laughs> infuriating to them. Right. Like <laughs> yes. I said, it has nothing to do with your, them believing you're a good doctor. It literally is. You are married to them. They cannot, they can't hear it all the time. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, well, I want to thank you so much for your time and wisdom and insight. Uh, I hope that listeners definitely picked up on a lot of the great things that you were saying and are able to implement even the smallest thing to assist them in their new relationship. Uh, Is there one thing I always ask people is if they've done any self-care for themselves, that realistic self-care today or this week, as well as if you have any like key information you would have given to yourself way back when as a not way back when you're not your kids are (laughs) a hundred years ago yeah uh when uh you had your kids um I think a lot of what you said already is great advice for new parents to take yeah so the self-care thing um Yes. Realistic. Okay. So realistic is also relative. So I'm going to say, because my kids are a little bit older and the position that we're in, my self-care can look very different than it did in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Like in the beginning, I was still, I mean, for years, I had such a hard time even prioritizing a shower. Um, And I think showers are self-care. I mean, I think personal hygiene is self-care. We don't think of it that way, but it is. Um, and that's often why we feel so funky, you know, mm-hmm. like I know in COVID, I even felt that like, cause I wasn't like, there were times where I was showering like once or twice a week. And I'm like, Oh my God, that's disgusting. I feel gross. Well, of course I feel gross. I'm not like taking care of myself because I wasn't going anywhere. Right. Like I was like, yeah, right. no one's going to see me. Um, so, but now, so I did just do some self-care this week. I had to preface that with, please understand where I was. <laughs> Um, but my self-care this week was, I was feeling because I run my own businesses, I was feeling really overwhelmed and behind and just kind of, I was feeling stuck and just like in this like kind of rut thing. And I've been doing different things around diet and exercise to help me, you know, to feel better and sleep routines. But 
I was like, I need, I need a change up. So I ended up kind of impromptu renting a hotel room for two nights. Initially it was going to be one. And again, I say this with understanding that now my husband is retired. So I do have somebody here to, you know, where to yeah. like, take care of the kids and stuff. But I, it's a strategy that I use that really works for me. It one, it's like, Oh, the peace and quiet and nobody is like interrupting me constantly and asking me for things. And, and, you know, and some of that stuff is fun stuff. We've been having a lot of like fun time as a family, but I needed the space and I was able to go and work on some projects that I had like 70% done. And I was kind of waking up feeling stressed about because I just wasn't finding the time in the day. And so that's just a strategy I use for myself. And I was able to get things done. I felt so great. Like even I had to pop back home. It was the hotel was only eight minutes from our house. Um, Cause I found this like really good deal on like Travelocity or something. And I was like, I had to stop back to grab something. And my husband's like, wow, you look great. Like your energy. And it was, I had only slept two hours that night because I was up all night working. Oh, wow. That's a whole separate thing. But I felt so good to be caught up. Like mm-hmm. to keep catching up, I should say. And to be able to finally like, oh, this this is off my this is off my plate now. It felt right. so fantastic. And so for me, it does look a little different now. I mean, there are still those times where I've been neglecting like getting a chiropractic adjustment or taking a shower or um, you know, taking a walk outside or hanging out with a friend. Like it's all still the normal things too. Mm-hmm. So it's not that, but but yeah, you know, I guess maybe that's hope is it can change. There can be like levels where, you know, you go and do that. Now, to, I, I will still wouldn't have prioritized going to a spa. Well, one, I, spas aren't open, right? <laughs> but, but at the same, so what was available to me, there's less options available to me. But because I knew that the self-care was actually getting caught up so that I could feel more less stressed and get more sleep on the regular. So it's unconventional, but that's my thing. (laughs) I'm going to link to all of your ways to find you ways to learn about you, get in touch your different podcasts because you are like wonder woman with all the different things that you do and run. (laughs) Um, And you're just also really fun to listen to on your episodes. So I will link to those. Is there anything else you'd like to leave listeners with? Um, Well, I guess I hope the takeaway is one, what you're going through is really normal, but it doesn't mean that it has to be that way. Like that doesn't have to be your fate. Right. Um, And so it's normal. So don't like beat yourself up too much. Don't think like somehow this speaks bigger about who you are as a person or what your relationship is. Um, but it is about just getting creative and doing small things to improve your relationship and your connection. And it's those, it's these little tiny things we do that we add up that become really transformational. It's not the big giant gestures that we see in all the movies, you know, like it's not the movie version of, I do this one grand gesture and everything is fixed and our relationship is perfect. It's like, I love that. Cause I'm a romantic. Mm-hmm. But the reality is it's the small things. It's the small I things. That add up. Love that. I have an episode about the little things yeah. that is a topic of many things. Cause mentally the little things add up. So I absolutely love that. That is your Uh, take away the tiny things. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I hope you were able to get as much out of that interview with Amber as I did. And also we both shared a lot just about our personal relationships. And if nothing else, you can feel that you're not alone in, you know, having a hard time getting your relationship back after having a baby. At the end of each episode, you hear about what um, the guest has done for some realistic self-care. A little bit of self-care that I did just for myself is I actually signed up for something where I can do some dance classes uh, at my own pace at home. And I know I teach bar, I teach Pilates, I do these things, but sometimes I just want somebody to do all the planning, all of that stuff, and me just to follow along to move my body. 
And so I'm really excited about signing up for that and seeing how that goes this coming week. All right, now is the time that I ask you what your realistic self-care for the day and week looks like. Share what you have done for yourself or share what you've identified with that you want to put in place for your relationship after listening to the interview. Tag the Momxiety Club, that's M-O-M-X-I-E-T-Y Club, on um, Facebook or Instagram and use the hashtag realistic self care. You can also send a voice message by heading to join.momxietyclub.com and clicking on the send voicemail button so I can give you a little bit of the spotlight on a future episode. And you know what? It's really fun to have you call in so that your story can also be shared so we can all help each other not feel so alone in our motherhood journey. Thanks for listening. And don't forget to subscribe and share the podcast with another mom so we can help each other. Are you ready to be a Momxiety Club insider? Well, head to join.momxietyclub.com to gain access to emotional and physical support for the stress, anxiety, and overwhelm that comes along with motherhood. There you'll find information about how to work with me on movement and mindset, one-on-one, or by joining the Momxiety Club membership, which it's less than $10 a month. It's an amazing value and helps keep the podcast going. And if you're just looking for some tidbits of information before you're ready to dive in, you can head to join.momxietyclub.com and you can get some of our free downloads, exercises that are great for new moms, and sign up for our email list to stay in the know. The Momxiety Club podcast is not intended to take place of medical advice or therapy. If you are in crisis, call your local emergency number or the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK.